today's session. It's a pleasure to have Pavel Plotko, who in person, after you know, years ago, he gave uh, uh, in the middle of the pandemic uh, a nice course on uh, introductory course for our master students. And now he's here in person. Thank you, Thank you Paolo. Thanks. <coughs> for uh, giving me the opportunity. So not only I love to you know, meet you guys in person, but, but Rome is my favorite city. So it's a great pleasure to, to see three-dimensional people in Rome. <laughs> um, thanks for coming, despite of you know early hour and the strike on the communication. So I'm a practical person, and practically I'll try to answer why uh, not the people are, are like you, because you are already convinced. I, the unconvinced should be convinced to actually take a look and uh, uh, use topological data analysis. So let's start. Um, in general, we can offer something better than, than averages. Our invariants, like, like persistent homology or characteristic based, are somewhat higher dimensional. Okay, we agree, right? Um, if uh, if you want to say some more, well, we exactly speak about the dimensional analytics of some kinds of persistence diagrams. Usually, when you project from your data, which oftentimes can be for this something dimensional to something high dimensional, but not one dimensional as an average, you are less likely to, to, to lose any important information. Yes? No? Who say yes? Okay, let's. Uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you for. <laughs> so, okay. So, let's see. I, I think I may speak for, for a few more minutes. Um, when you speak to an applied person, you need to cross a few walls. First of them is the wall of abstraction. And I'm not saying it's not necessary. It is by all means necessary, but we need to communicate it well. So, uh, you know, there is the standard quote from Solzhenitsyn, who, who despite for being a uh, Famous writer who spent half of his life in, in Soviet Gulag. He was also a mathematician, topologist for training. And even though topologists back in you know 20s of the last century haven't considered topology to be very applied. Uh, even nowadays, even yesterday, we saw blenders like this. If you show it to a person who is not used to it, they may get scared. Oftentimes, you want uh, people to think about topology. In terms of uh, you know the famous quote from Gunnar's paper and how to read it, and we need to kind of build a gap between uh, you know this and that. And then that's I'll try to elaborate how I think that should be done. Okay. Um, so we need to give people reasons why why you should care. Well, topological invariants typically are robust with respect to noise, um, and you know the famous example is well. The invariance with respect to a continuous deformation. That's a nice example. As I wrote in my tutorial, you can, you can actually uh, understand it in uh, a couple of ways at least. You can understand it negatively, saying that most topologists cannot turn apart the coffee bar from, from a donut. That's, uh, that's not the best answer you may give. But you may also consider, you may also think about it positively. Um, namely, when you when you work on the data. They are usually very deformed. However, our brains are very well trained to, to, to recognize those deformations. And in, in this occasion, I always use this. You know, there are many memes about it. The, the Alibat, the unfinished horse. Uh, you get the parts when your data are good, very good quality, moderate quality, and maybe very bad quality. But, but, but still, we can recognize that there is a platonic idea of the shape that horse shape, right? So, and that's that's what topology is about. If you want to make it more concrete, there's just the simple exercise you do. So you sample points from something which is topologically non-trivial. So the first non-trivial object in my head is a, is a unit circle, and then you add a little bit of noise, and then you add a little more noise. Once you, comp once you compute persistent homology in dimension one, in the in the case without noise, you see a very clear signal, no noise. If you add a little bit, you see a little bit of noise over here. Of course, they corresponds to some short cycles that are bored and soon after dies. And likewise over here, even for this big amount of noise, when you declare uniform noise, I am not adding salt and pepper type noise because that mess up uh, the picture. 
Uh, in this case, we still see a clear separation between signal and the noise, even in the presence of a considerable amount of noise. So that is why persistent homology is potentially useful in a quite wide range of applications. Um, so that's message number one. Message number two, it's always good to piggyback on someone else's observation. So the observation made by people from another community. And uh, let's see. Uh, this, this is a classical example from, from mid 70s, last century, on the squad rat. And uh, it's a collection of four point clouds, four very simple point clouds in, in the plane, uh, which have the same summary statistics and also have the same uh, regression line. Um, so if we look at the, our data from a prior lens of a summary statistics, Average standard deviation correlation between dimensions. Those pictures are almost exactly the same. Once we care to do a scatter plot, we immediately see that they are vastly different. So, statisticians realize that, and if you read the original and scope this paper, the, the, the message is always visualize your data. So, then in, in, I think it was 90s or, uh, or 200, sorry about the power here, let me try to do it again. Um, they, they push it to the limit with the Datasaurus data set. So as you see, the same up to third digit uh, summary statistics, vastly different shapes. Again, always visualize your data. And everything is perfect until you realize that most of the data are not two dimensional. So it's instrumental to visualize your data sets, but typically in biology, you're looking at hundreds, even thousands of dimensions. And uh, this is exactly our edge. This is, this is where topological invariance came into rescue. Now we'll have a few examples already on this. But once we go through this reasoning, the typical question people ask me is, OK, what's the stuff that you can do with topology that you cannot do without it? And then, then this is where the fun begins. So, so we are starting to search for, for a killing example. We are starting to search for a case where you really cannot avoid topology. And I, want this, I think there's one case where you, in which it's clearly shown that you cannot avoid topology, and I won't be speaking about it. If you want to hear the story, talk to me later. But um, I want to make another point. So we'll be searching for a killing example. And uh, you know, the other example doesn't fit the story, so, so I'll skip it. Um, and uh, shamelessly, I will be speaking mostly about my work, but uh, let me mention it. I think a very, very perfect piece of work by, by, by Asafi Lalka and the others when they are looking at uh, amorphous uh, structures. They're looking at the glass. The glass is an interesting object. It's not solid, it's not liquid, it's something in between. And uh, by looking at persistent homology, persistent diagrams, they actually discover various configurations of atoms of this amorphous. Uh, being a more state of matter. And I, I think that that's a very nice piece of technology and topology clearly tells you that there is something more than liquid, solid, gas, and plasma. And that's, uh, we got a very nice, we got a very nice and clear definition. If you haven't read this paper, by all means, uh, give it a try, very nice, nice PLAS paper. Um, there are other applications. So shape is something uh, which is very common in your data. Let's take a look at something that each of us, every single one of us had, which is a bomb. What we have over here is a micro CT scan of a trabecular bomb taken from uh, two different patients, similar, with the same gender, similar age. The patient on the left hand side happened to be a osteoporotic patient, the patient on the right hand side is, uh, let's say, normal with respect to the age. But what we can observe is that the trabeculum. As a part of the back, well, the back bone, uh, the vertebrae are thinner, and on the osteoporotic case than in the in the control case. Uh, the number of cycles, if you think about it, we get the feeling that there are a few more white cycles over here than over there. So, so we may kind of speculate, okay, we we, we are biased towards topology, but maybe topology can tell us something. Yeah, let's actually load those images to persistent homology. Let's compute the persistence diagrams. Let's put them on the same scale, and here they are. Osteoporotic dimension, zero dimension one. Dimension two is essentially not present because you don't have points in your bones. Uh, that's healthy. That's osteoporotic. They're on the same scale. 
the thing about the scholarly point process is that they, they seem to be different. Okay, so the next step, we are taking five controls and five patients. First, we can compute distances between those diagrams, right? Let's do it. So here, here are the heat maps of the distance matrix. Dimension zero, dimension one. Clearly, we see that there, there are groups of five which are kind of similar to each other, but very different uh, between themselves. And I don't need to tell you what, what those groups are. Uh, in fact, we can do more. We can actually predict how resistive the bone is based on the persistence diagrams using essentially random forest regression or any type of regression you may, you may want to use it. But uh, that story doesn't fit into a picture, so I'm swapping it under the rock. First of all, let's speak about something more practical, washing detergents. Um, so, uh, zeolites. Zeolites are, uh, yeah, the main industrial application is in uh, washing detergents. Um, and those are, you know, uh, chemical materials, of course, chemical materials. Chemical composition is very simple. This is silicon and oxygen. Silicon in the middle, oxygen in the four vertices of a tetrahedra. And think about it as Lego blocks. So you, you, you put together those Lego blocks to, 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 to build uh, nanoporous structures. Okay? Those are zeolites. Uh, 150 up to 200 existed on the planet or has been synthesized. Uh, crystallographers build the database of millions of potential zeolites, depending on how you stick them together. And uh, well, washing detergents are one thing, but there are more serious possible applications that are on the table, starting from CO2 capture or, you know, uh, Better fuel for your cars if you want to use methane and not uh, gas from Russia. Um, you know, a few, a few other. And then there is an obvious question. So, so we have 200 existing and millions potential. How to find among those millions of materials the best performing one for your favorite application? Okay. So that's something you can do using uh, quantum Monte Carlo simulations. Those are unfortunately very heavy simulations. Uh, so they don't scale well, you have millions of materials. You need to be able to, to say, okay, well, 90% of them are useless. And this is precisely what we do with topology. So what would we, this is kind of like an assumption which was partially verified and an act of faith, saying that if you have a material of a certain shape, and remember, zero lights have the same chemical properties. So only, the only factor that determines the performance is the shape of the force. So if I have a material of a certain shape and a similar material, in this material is good, then a similar is likely to be good. If this material is bad, similar is likely to be good. So what we can do is, uh, by using this observation, we can filter out quite a lot of uh, unused, potentially useless materials. We can only actually restrict them to, to making quantum Monte Carlo simulation for those which, which have a good prognosis, let's say. And this is what was done. Um, so, uh, Following this paper, the, the groups were able to find a better one than the currently known, and they were able to synthesize it, and I don't know how the story ends. We kind of went through, through the whole pipeline. Besides, uh, well, based, based, based on the sample of the space of materials, we are able to actually uh, visualize using, in this case, a uh, conventional map of how this space looked like, and we were able to see different groups. Which, which really corresponds to different geometrical shapes of the material. Okay, so that was the second story. Let's move to the third story, and I think there will be two more, and then I will actually make a conclusion about it. Speak about phases of matter. So, so, so we are going, going slowly into, let's say, a statistical physics. Over here, we have a, have a phenomenon of a phase separation in alloys. So what happens is you have a binary alloy, an alloy consisting of two materials. When it's produced, typically it's very well mixed. So local density of one material and another material is the same everywhere. That's the, the, the starting initial condition in this picture right now. But then you heat it up and cool it down multiple times. You do it very quickly, and then you know the space separation is happening. So, so what we see over here is well, black means higher concentration of one material, and white means higher concentration of the other material. So the, the atoms of the same type they tend to cluster together. But depending on the initial proportion of masses of those materials, they cluster together in a different way. Those are the results of the simulation we did based on the heater cook model. This is a stochastic PD. That's one of at least five different models to describe this, this phenomena. And uh, 
you know what is striking if you look at this computer as a topologist? There's clearly a different shape for this proportion of masses, this proportion of masses, and that proportion. So there's a natural question. Can you use topology to tell them apart? That's a trivial task. Of course we can. But, but, but even more, if we, what we actually did is we, we changed in the proportion of masses with the step of 1%. We're still able to tell them apart, provided enough data. I kind of explained the, the classification procedure over here. So, so, so we actually set it up as a learning problem. We train a very, very simple classifier. That's kind of actually, that's actually KMN classifier. We got very high accuracy. What does it mean? Well, it means that we have a very nice topological persistent homology-based signature. Why people should care? Well, people should care because they, okay, they can actually observe those, those patterns in, in reality using very interesting techniques. So I won't be spending much time speaking about it. But long story short, you can have a real images. So not only you can validate the models against the real images, but given a real image, you can say, okay, we are kind of in that phase of the process. So probably you should replace this pipe before we have the second channel model or something along those lines. So right? This metallurgy, is this, is this like the, the powder metallurgy where it's the, the, they grind the pieces up into atoms and mix it? And heat? Uh, no, so, so that, that's actually, so, so it was uh, back like 10 years ago, this was heavily supported by DOE in the United States. So, so they are really interesting in cooling system. In the, but they, uh, how, how, do you know how they originally mix, they create the mixture? Is it, is it a, a process? I mean, the standard thing you do in the iron work, uh, I guess, for a low high quality iron. Okay. Okay, any questions? So it's, it's mixed at uh, like a liquid form. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, no standard thing. Yeah, yeah. okay. So in, yes. the, in the previous slide, you were deducing the density proportion from the persistent. Uh, yes, uh, so, so that was a more complicated. So, so we actually solve the PDE, and that's time dependent, right? So, so you start from, from a mixed state, and then you are moving to this gray state. Um, so at, at the fixed time, we, we have a map from minus one to one, where minus one means, you know, 100% of this material, one means 100% of that. We have all the middle stages. So we constructed a vector of persistence diagrams and we use that as a signature. Okay? And the, the prediction you do is what is the density of, the, of each material versus? Yes, yeah, so, so we, we predicted two things the, the proportion of masses, the initial one, and the time, how far away you are from, you know, the initial condition when everything was not mixed. Okay. Okay. Other questions? Right. Let's go. Uh, think phase transitions. So uh, we spoke about the Ising. Let me do Ising model, standard model in statistical physics. So, so you know, the previous thing was about phases on matter. There was no sharp phase transition. I want to speak about sharp, sharp phase transitions at the moment. Um, what's the idea? Let's say that you that, that have a uniform grid and every grid element you have either spin. You have two, two possible spins, either spin up or spin down. Or there's a Hamiltonian you can assign to this problem, but there's a classical uh, model by, by, by Ising. I think he was German, so I should pronounce it Ising. Um, and it doesn't have a phase transition in uh, one dimension. Um, in two dimension it has. If we actually look at the number of different configurations, plot zero and the first betting numbers, because it's, you know, kind of easy, naked white, naked black, and you have black and white pictures, you can assign betting numbers. We see a jump. Once we increase the size of our configurations, the jump will become more and more discontinuous. So that's precisely the signature of a phase transition, which you can also get from Hamiltonian, but this time you are getting from betting numbers. So, what do you have on the x-axis? Oh, that's and the x-axis is the critical temperature. No, you said it's the temperature, and the, 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 the job is on the critical temperature. So it, it has a phase transition in dimension two. In dimension three, we don't know. I think we know it's four and higher. It was proven using, it was proven using mean field theory. Uh, we don't know about dimension three. However, when we start to plot those uh, Betty numbers, we see the sharp transition everywhere. So topology is telling us something, not only about the phases of matter, but also about the phase transition. So look back at the Asus paper on the glass. So we can speak about 
of quite a few different phenomena. Let's actually try to take those five examples and uh, abstract away what we are really doing, well, what do they have in common. So typically we have a some stochastic process. It may be, look at your glass, different regions, they may be different, but they, they do have something in common. Let's look at our bones. They may be different, but they do have something in common. If you are not osteoporotic, they look similar. If one of us is osteoporotic, then one of us will be different. The same with uh, material science, the same with uh, statistical physics. We have a number of stochastic processes that are giving us typically some function. We build a topological descriptor, and then we are trying to answer. Do they cluster together? Do they come from the same distribution? Do they come from different distributions? That's what we are trying to ask. And that's kind of normal. But there's something very standard that kind of fits into the scheme. I need to only replace one thing. So I remove the stochastic process and I put the point process. And uh, once you go back to Statistics 101, they have these questions of. Uh, one sample and two samples of the tests, which are the following. So when we are speaking about one sample problem, we are giving point process, a some collection of points, and a cumulative distribution, distribution function. And what we want to ask is, is where this collection of points sampled from this distribution function? So we are formally setting up the two hypotheses, H0 and the alternative hypothesis H1. H0 states that yes, it was. H1 states that no, it wasn't. And we want to answer. We want to answer the idea, you know, something like p-value may come and uh, to the play the, the alpha level as well may come to the play. That's one sample problem. So, so we have a collection of points and distribution. So we are asking if this collection of points was or was not sampled from the distribution. There's a two sample problem as well, which is kind of more similar to what we did, because typically we don't have this underlying knowledge. So in two sample problem, I'm giving you two collection of points, and I'm asking you where they sample from the same distribution or not. Right? So that's exactly what we have. We have one collection of points sampled from one distribution, the second collection of points sampled from the second distribution, and we want to check if those distributions, given the data we have, can be considered the same or not. And, uh, well, statisticians are, have spent a lot of time uh, answering this question very, very successfully. Kolmogor of Smirnov is the best, but, but you know, there are better alternatives. Kramer from Mises, uh, Anderson Darling, uh, He Square, Shapiro Weeks, Wills, etc. Uh, they do have something in common. They are heavily depending on the fact that you can order your axis. You have a total order on your, on your domain. So, in other words, that you are living in one dimensional space. Um, so, it happened to me oftentimes when you know, somebody from economics or finance came to me with a point cloud, 10 dimensional point cloud. And I asked me the question, Robert, is this point cloud random? Well, you know, when you are working with those type of people, you should understand that their question, this is a legitimate question. We should make it precise, and we actually talked to make it precise. But then we started to look how to test it. And of course, you don't invent the theory. First, you check what's, what's on the shelf. There, is, there wasn't much on the shelf. So for, for two-dimensional one, there are, there are actually theoretical results for KS and Kramer for Mises. Um, there is an implementation which seems to be still work in 3D. You will see in a second. Um, Again, KS should work in higher dimensions, but, but it's, you know, factorial uh, complexity makes it really, really impossible. So KS, what KS is doing is, in one dimensional case, we have a cumulative distribution, which is the red curve. We are building the uh, empirical distribution. We are looking at L infinity distance, and we are looking at, uh, compared to the appropriate quantile, so I'll just explain this in a second. If this distance is small enough, we say, okay, that they're very likely to be from the same distribution. If it's not large, we say no. So that's for uh, one sample test. For two, two sample tests, the idea is essentially the same, but we don't have the ideal cumulative distribution that we have to empirical ones. 
And then again, we are looking at them and adding anything in the distance. This is what KS <coughs> is doing. That's kind of the state of the art. I still it didn't help me to answer my, my, my colleagues from economics about the time dimensional molecule. So let's see what we can do. So we, we are developing, and I hope the paper should be out by, by the end of the month. We are developing those topo tests. And uh, let's start from the input. So, so the input is again in one sample case. It's a point cloud and the cumulative distribution. And I want this D to be considerably greater than one. So we are kind of in a regime which is not covered by, by the statistical test. And this is how it works. So um, first of all, we pick a number n, it should be quite big. Then we are sampling uh, an element sampled from the distribution. I think it, this should be n, sorry about that. And for each of the sample, we compute some topological invariants. I'm sure you would say, okay, persistence diagonal. Yes, we can, but we want to have a theoretical guarantees. It's, we were not able to prove anything for, for persistence diagram. We are able to prove something for the Euler characters. So let's stick with this because you know, people like theoretical guarantees that they are that they, they really support the machinery. And then so we compute this. So I think it should be M over here. So we compute the for, for every of our sample, we compute the Euler characteristic curve and the average. And we claim that it converges into something for a fixed distribution, the underlying Euler characteristic curve. And the, by the way, for some distributions, so for, I think for normal, the, the, the exact formula for this is known. But for others, we are doing Monte Carlo, essentially. Uh, then, so we have, we have this, this average one, the average Euler curve. And, and then we are sampling farther and computing the corresponding Euler characteristic curves and compute the distances between them. We get inspired by Kolmogorov spin-off and by the results of our experiments, so we choose uh, the L infinity distance. Uh, simply speaking, because LP didn't perform as well. That's interesting. I don't understand why. Uh, well, here it is. So we have we have a bunch of distances, and then we order them. We compute the right quantile. So the at the, at this, at the significance level alpha which should be fixed somewhere here. Uh, we are checking the percentage of the distances and the, this, this level alpha and the, and, the, and the level alpha. So let's say we have 100 distances and the level alpha is 0 0.05. So we're looking at the fifth largest distance and this is our travel bar. So what we will say later in the testing phase, getting into the next slide, when a new distribution is coming and computing its distance, of, of the new distribution from the average Euler characteristic curve I got from my training. And if the distance is above this, this number I got from the previous step, I reject the hypothesis, and if it's below, I accept the A0. So that's the test we are doing. Um, you can get p-values out of this as well, if you wish. Biologists like them. Um, so why, why, why I like this approach? It's general. Other characteristic curves don't care about the dimensions you are sampling from. Um, it's computationally feasible. So those are hard computations, but we can make it. Unlike, for instance, KS, we have a theoretical result. I'll briefly mention one of them. And uh, we are better. Uh, what you need to be aware of is. Uh, you know, it's the topological invariant, translation, rotation, uh, region motion invariance. Um, and uh, well, if we take a Cartesian probe, but it doesn't really matter which order we are multiplying things. Uh, all those things can be tested, for instance, using standard moments. But, you know, people should be aware that we have some caveats over here. Uh, so, on the theoretical side, there are a few pages of proofs. Let me just show what I think is, is, is important. Uh, so, so I consider this a consistency result. So what's the probability of the second type error? So, so, so that we reject uh, H0. If we fail to reject H0, we don't reject H0 when, when we actually should reject it. It turns out that this probability 
is exponentially bounded by the number of points you are assigned. Of course, there is a constant in front of it that depends on the dimension. Nevertheless, if you give me enough points, this probability is going to zero reasonably quickly. That's a good thing, right? Um, again, technical details and pushing for this paper by the end of the month. Uh, to sample problem, we use kind of approach similar to uh, permutation test. So this time we have a two point out sampled, sampled from a different distribution. We compute the Euler characteristic curves, and then we put those two point outs together and resample again randomly from them. So you know, swap and then and, and, uh, resample. Uh, we are getting, all based on the resample, we are getting the new Euler characteristic curves. And we are checking, first of all, we are checking the distance between the Euler characteristic curves on all of the original point clouds and the ones we are getting after a shock. In question, well, if we get larger distance after shuffling, um, it's probably that. And we are checking how many times that happens divided by the number of shuffles we are making. That's how we are getting the p-value of the statement so that they are the same value. That's what is this upstream? Aha, so uh, yeah, that, that's a counter. So, so I'm doing from p between one and n. There's a cardinality of this subset. Oh, so the cardinality of those subsets are the same as the cardinality of original sets. Yeah. So, so you think about you know those being the same size, the same, but but we want to keep the cardinality the same as the subsets. So, so what is p? So, you know, I copy pasted from the paper and I remove some of the data as I, I feel like we are summing over P. So, P bar varies between 1 and 9. It's the number of uh, iterations. Okay. So far, so good. So, let, let's see. Okay, I make a bold, made a bold claim that it actually performs better. Let's, uh, let's actually see, see and look at some numbers. So, we, we took a uh, large collection of different data types. We took a number of Monte Carlo repetitions. We compared in KS in the cases where we are able to actually use KS. Um, we fixed the alpha significance level as everybody else to 0 0.05. Don't ask me why. Uh, <clears throat> there are some problematic cases. We'll see them in the later. But again, KS, we are picking KS and we are picking the others. Uh, thanks for Google for the simulation times. So that's the KS results. Uh, that's the test power. And, uh, you know, those are the different distributions. If they are confused with some other distribution. And what you want is to have this picture as yellow as possible. Because power one is good, power below one is bad. So that's KS in uh, dimension three. Yeah, no, no. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, I was wondering which dimension. This kind of, hey, hey, as I mentioned, 3, 250 points, significance are level 0.5, you can see actually see them. Bad, but that's a top of this. And, uh, yeah, so we have average power of KS 0.8, average power of the top of this 0.9, dimension 3, uh, Dimension 5, it's top of this, I am not showing you KS. Because even Google doesn't have enough computational power. Uh, but we are still okay. You know, that there are some distributions that we confuse quite often. And uh, so, you know, my collaborator could actually know statistics. He have an explanation for that. So those can be confused. Um, what else? So th those are pictures for a fixed number of points. What we also want from our test is that when I'm showing you more points, I don't want the power of the test to go down. And I want the power of the test to be monotonic. And here it is indeed. So number of points, power of the tests. Um, so we are blue, KS is uh, orange, I would say. And uh, we are always above the KS. And the curve behave as it should. Uh, to sample tests. We are still better than, than KS. So this is me, this is KS. Again, the computational resources in order to do, to do the permutation test. So if you've ever done a permutation test, you know how painful it is. So this is how we are doing it right now. It works well. Uh, so if there's a tech congress, and I'm not done, not done by the talk right now. So that, that, that's only the first part. 
the take home message is uh, if you look at the papers at TDA, and they apply TDA, there is this common scheme. There are something from some distribution. Maybe even the bones of different people, but in terms of the distribution, and compare persistence diagrams. Usually they work, at least if they are reported in the paper. And uh, what, what we have over here is um, a simple statistical problem of quite important manner. Uh, we are showing that if you use topology on a characteristic curves, which is you know a very, very simple version of topological invariant. Uh, we are performing comparably or better to the state of the art, even in dimension one. Uh, and we have a theoretical guarantees for that. So the message is topology gives you a tool to distinguish the different distributions. And by distributions, I, not I do not only mean point processes, although that's one important case, but I also mean you know, very general class of distributions. With the theoretical guarantees, and yes, uh, so some if you look at the proof, we are not using the fact in the proof that um, our, our other characteristic curves comes from point processes. So that, that's much more general argument. And I hope that that will open up an avenue to, uh, let's say, theoretical results, theoretically motivated uh, results. Hope to have something in the uh, using persistence diagrams, but then having this type of theoretical guarantees is not only. Okay, so I think I have about 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Shall we? Yeah. Yeah, let's do, let's do some mappers. Um, so mapper is another working course of TDA, right? Persistence diagrams uh, and mapper. And um, what is mapper good for? There are two things. You can see the shape of a high-dimensional point cloud. And if you happen to have a one-dimensional function defined on every point, you can kind of plot this functional relation using the colors. And that's what mapper is for. An example in this case of a ball mapper, uh, banknote authentication data sets, you have the number of banknotes, bank, num number of banknotes characteristics, some banknotes are fake, some banknotes are not fake, real. And uh, shape of the letter Y, quite typical in TDA, uh, red vertices covers uh, the banknotes which are real, blue vertices covers the banknotes that are fake. And again, you know, there, there you can draw various types of conclusions, like, you know, okay, there's, there's something different about those fake bunch, those two collections of the fake bunch ones. And if you actually go to UC Irving dataset and dig out the paper, you realize that they use two different printers. Correspondence is obvious, so that's what Mark can do. Um, yeah, well, I, I need to paraphrase Paul. <laughs> Admit it, every person has a fetish. You, you, you agree? Yes, <laughs> we agree. Good. Uh, I also have one. Uh, but I want to also make a bold statement. Well, the bone mapper is uh, more explainable than the conventional mapper. Uh, let me tell you why I think so. So, if you think about conventional mapper, uh, there, there are a few steps, and we, we had a conversation yesterday with someone. Yes. Uh, you said you. Not like mapper because it has number of parameters. So, so that is actually common. Take a data set X, then you need a lens function. You need an overlapping cover of the range of X under this range function. Then you're taking a pullback. You are choosing your favorite mastering algorithm, and then you are computing that. Uh, so I kind of bold face with the parameters, and then go. So imagine you are working in bank, and, and, and you, you go to a person, you are used to working. Well, you want, you want to go to manager and say, okay, you should you should invest with this billion dollars into that because this is what mapper tells me based on those parameters. I mean, good luck. Um, when you take the ball mapper, it may be easier. So, 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 so you take your data set, that's the same, and you're selecting equally distributed points in this data set, fixing a radius, and then you say, okay, equally distributed points are because I want to have a good sample of my points. And then I'm taking the ball. And the ball will cover points which are similar uh, to one of my points from one of my landmark points. And then, this way I'm building balls around the, my landmark points, and then I'm collecting landmarks if there's some overlap. So I'm collecting, connecting, really using an edge, edges, regions defined by balls to the similar properties. 
That's what Bollmapper is doing. So we saw the Bollmapper plot on the bank of authentication data sets. And I'm claiming that if you only have two parameters, so radius and uh, the metric you are using, much easier to explain it to people. To the extent that actually my colleagues from economics finance, they, they, they are trying to do so. So back then, back even before the, the, the uh, parliamentary elections in the UK, after Brexit, we did this Brexit analysis phenomenon. So you think about Brexit. Brexit, I won't make any political judgments. I would say Brexit is a failure of mathematical modeling. Because if you look at every election poll, it was supposed to be 58 to 4, 48 to 52 to stay. So there was a mistake over this 4%, maybe 8, depends how you count. It's a huge mistake. You think about the loss of large numbers that it absolutely shouldn't have. Probably it means that they sample, you know, people they ask in the wrong way or they maybe answering in a fake way. What we did was, was to take uh, census data, you can census data. And uh, put it together with uh, the question, do you want to live or not? Um, so we are looking at something like, was it 30, 40 dimensional, 40 different characteristics from the census. Uh, you get this uh, meta shape. Uh, the blue ones are Brexiters, and the others are not. And the message we can get from here is that uh, you know, Brexiters are kind of much alike. It's much easier to make a targeted campaign for those people because they share so many characteristics that they are very homogeneous. You know? uh, while the people who want to live are all the way around. I think London is over here, Scotland was somewhere there. Mostly we actually look at this uh, from a perspective of uh, location, but you know there are all the social economical things playing all over. And then came the 2019 election. We did it before. But we ask another question. Okay, do you support Brexit? We can also ask, do you support Jeremy Corbyn? So he was the leader of the Labour's back then. And uh, so let's see, here's the Brexit. And here's the support for uh, Labour's. So what you should be looking at, you know, is this region over here. So Brexiters are here. And those people mostly support the Labour's. Jeremy Corbyn didn't want to admit if he wants to live or not. And he made... I think one of the biggest failures in the last 100 years for the Labour Party. Isn't that why, why we don't see him anymore? I don't know where they put that for us. Yeah? But, you know, you know if, if Corbyn uses TV, he actually careful to look at our blogs. He would know what to do. I'm not saying I'm supporting Labour. But, you know. Um, okay, I want to make a full circle. And I started from, um, let's say, mathematically inspired TDA. And I want to end up with uh, something pure mathematics. Coming from a pure mathematics, but I also think very strong potential to applications. And uh, as I work with uh, my student from from Verona, excuse me, and uh, my colleague from from North Carolina, it's about the knots. When we're thinking about the knot theory in TDA, I want to very far away. So we both have complicated objects to study. We, we know what are our objects. In, in case of uh, not theories, that those are the embeddings of S1 into I3. Uh, those two embeddings, if one embedding can be transformed into another by as isotopy, we consider it the same. So there is some equivalence relation coming here. And the, those embedded, those are complicated objects to study. So they did exactly what we did. They computed some invariant. Okay, we, we cannot study it in full generality. What we can do, though, is to compute some invariants so that isotopic nodes get the same invariants, and non-isotopic nodes, well, hopefully different, but you never know. So this is what they did, and there, there is a collection of different classical invariants or more modern invariants. Very modern invariants, Polish accent over here, I always want to, 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 to admit it. Uh, those are polynomials. And when you are speaking about polynomials, you can fix the basis of the polynomials. Once I fix the basis, and I take a poly, not polynomial, say Jones polynomial of a threshold knot, I can write the coefficients in the basis. So what I'm doing is I'm taking a knot, getting in Jones polynomial, and for a fixed basis, it gives me a point in some space. And I'm doing this because, of course, I want to have a point in that, right? So I do it for a collection of 
almost up to 17, 18 crossings, I got a point cloud. So I can go ahead and use, for instance, ball map there. And uh, I can color it by something not theorists care about. Uh, it is not signature. Please don't ask me to define it. That's what we have job. But they, they do care about it. So, so what, what we see is that uh, well, we, we have a heavy center, but there are you know, lots of different signatures seems to be located in different regions of the space of this Jones polynomial up to 15 crossings. That's for 15 crossings. Maybe for 16 crossings, you see a different picture. Well, no. For 16 crossings, we see a similar picture. There is this kind of self-similar structure happening over here. But it is up to or up. exactly that number? No, no that's uh, up to. So everything okay. includes. Well, but once you move from 16 to 17, then the majority is really the 17. Right? Uh, so it's not, it's not clear if we are considering all, but you really see the top most of the time. Okay? Um, we do Jones. Uh, we do Alexander polynomial. Alexander is boring. When you try to color it with uh, not signature, you get a mess. But once you realize that you can color it by not signature mod 2, you get a nice structure. So I think it's uh, zero in one branch and one in the other branch. And it was something known to mod theorists. Um, but we, we, see, we, we kind of see it explicitly. And then, you know, they have the same questions as we. Is multidimensional persistence, is euler characteristic curve better than persistence diagram? Well, of course it is because you can get one from another. But, but imagine that you think about two different invariants for which you have the, the, the property that you, in some cases, you have two objects that have, have the same one invariant but different than the other. But for another two objects, these this invariants are different but those are the same. It's precisely the case with knots and Alexander and Jones polynomials. If you can have two knots having the same Jones, different Alexander, can have different two knots having the same Alexander different Jones. So theoretically they are not comparable, but once we see, once we look at the pictures, well, we kind of tend to believe that this 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 is nice, and this is more or less chromatic than that. Can you can you quantify that? And uh, I argue that in some sense we can, because all the point clouds are coming from the same collection of knots. And we are just looking at two different invariants. Think about it abstract. Those are your objects, two different invariants. Uh, what we can do is we can make a mapper, mapper plot over here. We can make a mapper plot over there. And I'm looking at this mapper plot. I'm taking, picking one vertex. This vertex cover a number of opt knots. And I'm asking, okay, where the knots from that vertex are present over here? And I can do this exercise for every vertex over here. Right? Here's the result. I actually put it in one picture. So once you color your Alexander with kind of rainbow from left to right, you realize that uh, the coloring is transported so that you know, lots from here are roughly over here, and lots from here are roughly over here. You move along. In other words, knots that are close over here are more likely to be far away. So when I look at this picture, I'll say, you know, it's kind of more likely to find two knots that have, that have the same Alexander but different jobs. So my statement would be, well, if you want to do any machine learning, Jones probably is a better choice. So, so, I mean, we, 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 can, we can actually do a database query and ask how, how often that happened. But that's what but also we can, we can learn from mappers. And uh, what, what I wanted to point out over here is that mapper is not only good to put functions from your point cloud X into real life, but functions between two high dimensional point clouds is also feasible. There should be a subscript saying implementation available on our web page. It is available if you want to try it out, please let me know. I imagine that comparison would be, uh, uh, it would be, uh, the, the Alexander part would be richer if you replace the Alexander polynomials by the Alexander modules, but, I, but then I, I don't, you don't have a nice way of apologizing that, I guess. Yeah, point, they're making the point cloud. Yeah, out, out, out speak, so yes. Okay. Let's see. So uh, I'm already like over time, right? Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, maybe yes. let's let, let me actually skip the cancer like analysis part. Uh, let me thank my my group. Uh, so with respect to the Dioscuri, we are kind of done, but but we have. 
There should be a subsidy. <laughs> so, 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 so we have another project uh, related to nanoporous materials and the 3D printing. Uh, it should be hiring quite soon. Uh, that require the ability to generate large number of structures, uh, some statistical knowledge, programming knowledge. If you want to talk to me, I'm more than happy to talk to you. Uh, that's it. Thank you so much for your time. So, so, so we use standard monomial basis. Of course, shifts are necessary to be So, so how, how we did it in the beginning? Some of these are symmetric, so you have you know, the gapping powers, polluting powers. Um, once we consider, let's say, all the nodes up to 17 crossings, we multiply it so that the minimal power is x to the power of 0. And we necessarily we, we put it with 0 everything, and we use standard monomial basis. Uh, we haven't tried different bases. That's a good point. I don't think anything will change. Although, I won't make a statement right now that I can prove. Do you know what happens if you replace the Alexander with, I don't know, the Conway of validation? Uh, we haven't tried that, so we, try, we tried uh, also Home Flight TV, we tried Kovana homology. And uh, Alexander and Jones. Why you put the, uh, the ranks? Yeah, so we put the ranks. So we, we got the same thing, but we, we got the matrix and um, we vectorized it. We also padded it, but we didn't have to pad it with two directions instead of one. Um, we also got quite, quite interesting results with Kovano. Uh, um, so they, they look very much like Jones, but cleaner. In the sense that uh, you know the branches of different signatures are better separated, and uh, we also did another thing. Uh, so Humphrey PT specialized to both Alexander and Jones with some non-trivial nonlinear mappings, and we used that to some sort of uh, construction of the map around the top of ball map coverage, which also shows us better separation of, uh, uh, of signature. So there are there are stronger invariants, and we also see it. Um, we are trying, we are spinning our heads around how to actually make a hypothesis not theory based on those observations because that would be the ultimate aim to, to, to kind of show that TDA is not only useful for you know practitioners in various disciplines but, but also to pure mathematicians. So it's a pure computational mathematicians. Okay. Well, in this uh, for, for these knots, what was it, what were your seeds? What were your this L that you were drawing? You mean the, uh, uh, the radius? It, well, you you said you choose you know you choose some sample of elements and then you start looking at these balls. So yes, yeah, so which, so which uh, yes. everywhere we are choosing a random sample. All right, but, okay. but 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 then in order to show consistency, so so we have a better way coming up. But but at the moment what we are doing is you you are you are looking at different possible selections of those of, the, of those landmarks. Exactly. And you see that the the, the, the output is stable. Mm -hmm. And how how do you assure that they, how how do you assure that they are like uniformly distributed? And yes, so space of nodes, so somehow it's difficult uh, to just take random. I mean, I guess. Oh, how how you ensure? I'm taking an epsilon net. So I'm fixing an epsilon in the epsilon net. But but you look at the at the epsilon net on these uh, on the outcomes, right? On actually yeah. on these. But uh, but it could be that some nodes have you know. This is a space of nodes. You look no, no, that's, that's, why, that's why I always say what's, what is the space of nodes I'm looking at. So I'm looking at all the nodes which have the knot diagram with up to 17 crossings. And I don't know if you take a knot of minimal knot diagram of 25 crossings. I don't know where it is. Presumably that's a table where the knots are all prime as well, I'm guessing. So I think we took all the boss. Oh, is this like the Ben Burton one? Is that? I can check it with Brad oh, and yeah. get back to you. But, but uh, I would, I, she said all, uh -huh. and I trust her. And I, I, I'll, I'll, I can come back to you with an answer to this question. I can I, actually you open the paper and check because I, mean, I never cared. <laughs>
So why can that make sense? No, what I want to say is that sort of we we take this. Uh, oh, but you are taking random knots, not random. Uh, no, no, no. We are not taking random knots. We are taking all knots up to seven. Okay. All. But then you take a random. Uh, we are not taking random projections. We are not doing math. We are doing bomb math. No, no. But how how do you choose landmarks? That's the question. Random. But random from knots or from the this this. No, no. Uh, ran, random from the point cloud. Exactly, from the point cloud. And, but the question is like this point cloud, right? Because mm -hmm. that you represent it, it might happen that uh, some of the distribution of nodes going to be uh, the, to your invariance, mm -hmm. right? the point cloud could also, you know, here there could be some accumulation and your representation can be. Uh, the, the, the density is a really thing, that's what you were asking. Yes, yeah, so we are studying actually like representation of these nodes by this point cloud. Right? Exactly, so, so we, I am not claiming to study nodes, I am okay, claiming to the, study the some point cloud fixed representation. Okay, right. Because yes, I, I cannot make any, I mean, if you're looking at the space of nodes, how do you even define yeah, yeah, the measure yeah, yeah, of yeah, it? I know, I know, yeah. yeah yes, exactly. uh, that I don't know how to do. No. Uh, can you say two words on two more things? Well, I saw the famous picture uh, you know, by, by Carlson. Yeah, so that's Carlson. We, we all know that. So, so what they did over here was uh, Carlson, Nicolau, and Levy, the PNAS paper. Um, they look at the difference of uh, normal tissue to, to cancer tissue. So we are looking only at the breast cancer people. Um, <coughs> Those are, you know, tumors which are close to being normal. That's bad. Triple negative, very bad prognosis. Those are tumors which are different, very different from normal. But if you ever got a breast cancer, you want to be over here. Because they, 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 there is 100% survival in that region. And that, that's the big result in part of by uh, Monica Gangamer and uh, Pavlov. Um, what we did was uh, um, looking farther in this study, because if you think about it, what, what they did was they, and they built a mapper graph and they located a region with considerably higher survival in a part of that graph. So we, we said, okay, you know, we, we have the huge computational power, um, and we don't really know how to select the landmarks, and they, they had some motivation in selection, but then there was a lot of randomness as well. And then we asked the question, okay, can we actually look at very sample, different possible lens function in the conventional mapper, and look for hotspots, so subregions of a, of a graph. Then we kind of formally defined what, what do we mean by that. Um, with considerably lower and considerably higher survival, and we look at you know a number of different data sets, and we, we kind of located a number of hotspots. So over here, we were able to compress the data into almost linear structure. We found a hotspot of unfortunately lower survival, but still we hope that it can be clinically helpful. Um, what we did also was to select a reasonably small set of biomarkers, which tell the, the patients, are, your patients over here or somewhere else. Um, that, that's what we did, but uh, I'm not showing this picture yet. Uh, but we also do use the bone map and appropriately preprocess the data uh, from NKI, which, which is the data we are looking at over here. Um, you get something nice. You got two classes. Alive, not alive. Uh, if you think about it, that's kind of the best hotspot you may get. Uh, with you know, very clear uh, clinical uh, utility, because for some sorts of patients, you may, you may, you may actually try to introduce very, very heavy uh, treatment, help, and hoping for the best. If you, you can locate those patients, and it seems we can. So that, that's, uh, that's the study as well they put over here. Yeah, so that, that's. This is the pipeline. So we look at the number of lenses. Uh, we have an automatic way of detecting the uh, hotspots. Once we once we validate it, then we essentially using you know uh, statistical tests, KS being one of them. We are trying to look at a small set of biomarker and uh, asking clinicians if that's useful for that. So that is you know a very short summary of a bit longer story.
would like to ask, um, what's the methodology you use to uh, decide which radius to use? <laughs> That's a fantastic question. <laughs> Try and error, if, if, I, yeah. if I am to be totally honest with you. Um, we have on the table some strategy to try to, to judge um, whether the radius is or is not appropriate. So, for you, that will be if you, if you assume your data is something from the money problem. That is a reasonable assumption you need to prove something. And there are ways to approximate the geodesic distance of the, of the manifold. So I can get a distance matrix between points, and I also get an induced distance matrix from a buffer graph of the manifold. I want those to be similar. And I, that we, are, we are using this as a criteria. My paper is not published. Not only whether it's available. But, but, but uh, as for now, the answer is, as always with mapper, you, you do a stability analysis. So you move. Um, uh, your epsilon, so the radius of the ball, a little bit, and, and then see if uh, you get a consistent image. Usually you do, unless you are you know, in some critical regime when something is about to close and you see your radius is about to close, but not quite some time. You know, then things happen, but, but, but then we can see. Well, one thing that might be fun in your uh, polynomial comparisons for knots uh, uh, is uh, one other variable would be uh, is this a, 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 is this uh, is the thing called an isomorphism signature? It's, it, it sort of it describes the combinatorially simplest triangulation of the knot exterior. So mm -hmm. it it separates all knots. Yes. So if the knots are not isotopic, the signature is different. Yeah, we use this as well. And it's a text string. Yeah. Uh, so we didn't use a signature person. So, so what we did, it was a setting for point for for discrete Morse scales. So we took all the knots so, you know, up to it was like ten years ago. There's a paper with um, Marian Mosek and Graham Ellis. I think we went up to the eight or nine mm -hmm. eight crosses. We actually triangulated the knot complement, uh, reduced it using Morse theory and uh, using uh, tools from from GAP we compute uh, by one. Uh, and then check if there are isomorphic or not. So, so, so we show uh, until the, the line crosses, and this is where we stopped actually. Right. We didn't stop because we failed at the tenth process, so we just run out of computational power. We showed that you can actually do discriminate counts. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the, the reason why I'm thinking about the isomorphism signature is because uh, it would, uh, the, the common parts of the triangulation tells you if you have, like, have a hyperbolic structure, if you're composite, and so yeah. on. So. It could be an interesting that's, that's counterpoint a, to the policy. It's an interesting thing, so I'd like to talk to you about because, yeah. in fact, Radmila is coming to, to do more some course sabbatical. And we've thought about, so there's another metric to so check how many moves you need to make in order to move mm -hmm. from one node to another. And we, I, I kind of asked her, but we never had a chance to discuss whether we can use it as a pseudometric. Yeah. Because if we can, then we can check if this pseudometric is kind of comparable. Gordian distance or whatever it's called? I, I, yeah. Yeah. I, <laughs> perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, perhaps it has a name. Yeah. If, if this metric is kind of comparable to the metric on the coordinates of polynomials. Because if it does, it means that it has certain meaning. And I totally agree that taking co coefficients from polynomials not necessarily means anything for not theorists. That's, that's a weak point of that point. Mm -hmm. But if you show that you know that it's kind of similar to that metric, then then you can argue that perhaps there is something. I, I think it's it's quite. Uh, I, mean, I think there is. A, <clears throat> this is probably going to be a big difference because the the Gordian graph of knots is uh, mm -hmm. all the vertices are infinite valence, so you can get sort of you can get uh, the, you can do sort of crazy crossing changes mm -hmm. where where like the this is arc that connects one strand to the other. Mm -hmm. If you use an arc that does Okay. Ridiculous things. You you can create some very different knots and infinitely many different ones. So I, I think I, I think I think you'll get uh, a you'll get a huge picture. difference. Yeah. Yeah. That's why. Yeah. yeah. So I definitely want to talk to you. About that. Thank you, Pavel. Thank you so much.